Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Jeff Kossoff, Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Law at the United States Naval Academy. We will discuss his new book, The 26 Words That Created the Internet, which is published by Cornell University Press. So welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. So um, congratulations on the book. I think that it's really timely and a, a real achievement. And as you know, I really enjoyed reading it. And I think it's got a lot to share uh, with people uh, about you know, how the internet works and why it works in the way that it does. Um, so, so the book is about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And, and I got to say, it's the most engaging book I've ever read about a statutory provision. <laughs> um, Thank you. But, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's a little weird phrasing, but, but still, right? Uh, so I, I was wondering if you could start by um, you explaining what Section 230 is and, and where it came from. Yeah, sure. So to understand Section 230, you really have to go back long before the modern internet and you go into the 1950s when there were an increasing number of cases being brought against booksellers for selling books and magazines that were considered then to be criminally obscene. Uh, you had this one bookseller in Los Angeles who I focus on in chapter one of the book named Eliezer Smith. He's a 72-year-old uh, immigrant from Poland. He's operating a bookstore that sells a lot of erotic books, including one called Sweeter Than Life, which uh, is just a really bad, tawdry book, which I, of course, ended up buying for for the <laughs> book research. And uh, by today's standards, it's really tame. But, but at that time, at least the LAPD vice squad thought that it was criminally obscene. So he's arrested, tried, and sentenced to 30 years, or th sorry, 30 days in jail. Uh, and his attorney appeals the conviction all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court reverses the conviction. And they say that the ordinance that he was convicted under is unconstitutional because it applies even if he had no idea of what was in the book. And this was a guy who sold thousands of books. He said he didn't read any of them. So this is the rule that applies for decades to booksellers, even to TV stations that run advertisements, uh, that the only way that distributors of content can be liable for the words that they carry is if they knew or should have known. and. We start to run into some trouble in the early 1990s when services, primarily Prodigy and CompuServe at the time, two services that not, none of my students even know what they are anymore, but at the time they were the two big online bulletin boards, which would later provide gateways to the internet as well. And they had very different business models. Uh, CompuServe basically just ran a whole bunch of third-party content, both newsletters, user forums, and so forth, and it didn't have anyone to review the content. It had no policies. It was kind of the Wild West. Uh, Prodigy wanted to market itself as a family-friendly service. So Prodigy had all sorts of policies. They hired contract moderators who would delete material that they thought violated the policies. And both of them ended up getting sued in the early 1990s for defamation for third-party content. Uh, the first case is CompuServe and a federal judge in New York applies the rule that the Supreme Court articulated in Smith's case and dismisses the case, says that CompuServe was just a distributor like a bookstore and it had no reason to know or no knowledge of the defamatory content. Um, a few years later, there's a case that's brought against Prodigy and the a state, judge, state court judge on Long Island refuses to give Prodigy that same protection that CompuServe received for the sole reason that Prodigy actually moderated its content and had content policies. So what the judge said is Prodigy is more like a newspaper than a newsstand. Mm. So that's why Congress, and that, that's what led Congress to pass Section 230. So this all happened in 1995. And at the time, there was a Telecommunications Reform Act going through Congress. It was massive, thousands of pages long. And the big, it seems kind of antiquated right now, but the big dispute was 
how do you govern the competition between local telephone companies and long distance telephone companies to terms my students also don't know <laughs> what they are anymore. <laughs> but um, that was what everyone was focused on. But you had two members of Congress. Uh, there were two representatives at the time, uh, Chris Cox and Ron Lydon, who's now a senator, who had a real interest in internet related issues. Cox is a Republican, Wyden's a Democrat, and they wanted to find an issue to work on that sort of, that would have a substantive impact. And they realized they couldn't work on things like abortion. There would never be any agreement. This was the Gingrich revolution at the time with Clinton and the White House. Uh, so they said, Let, let's figure out a way to both encourage innovation on the internet but also, we want to uh, encourage, empower users and the services that they're using to come up with the best ways to block all of this content. Because what they recognized was the, these earlier cases created this incentive to not moderate, and they didn't want to do that. So they basically, um, working with some civil liberties groups and a few of Prodigy and uh, America Online, which had kind of grown to be the dominant provider at the time, they uh, developed this proposal uh, that was, the, the heart of it is the 26 words that created the internet, which is no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Uh, there's other provisions, uh, there are a few exceptions in the law, including for federal criminal prosecutions and intellectual property, but that's kind of the heart of it. And it, mm. re, it was competing with another proposal that was in the Senate at the time called the Communications Decency Act, which is why you have Communications Decency Act in the title. And the Communications Decency Act was a law that uh, would basically uh, impose criminal prohibitions on transmitting indecent material on the internet. So that the Senate took a very different route. Um, both the, so the Senate passed the indecency provisions, the House with barely any debate at all passed the Cox Whiting bill. And in conference committee, both of them ended up in the big telecommunications overhaul. And uh, then the next year, the Supreme Court struck down the Senate's indecency provisions under the First Amendment. So basically of the Communications mm. Decency Act, what you have left is this broad immunity for websites and or any interactive computer services. Uh, now, mm. the, the issue is nobody quite knew what, what it meant at the time. And I, I can't even overstate the fact that this got no attention when it was passed. Um, <laughs> I looked through every bit of news coverage of the Telecom Act, and there was a lot of coverage of the indecency provisions being passed. And there were journalists writing that the civil liberties groups and tech companies were just trounced by uh, family values coalitions and there would be no more free speech on the internet. Uh, and no, nobody really knew what section 230 meant. Uh, and that changed the next year because we mm -hmm. had a case, a, a really tragic case where a man named Ken Zarin, uh, who middle-aged photographer, real estate agent who uh, lived in his parents' house in Seattle, uh, he started getting all of these phone calls, and they were very angry, hostile phone calls. The reason he was getting these phone calls is someone had posted these um, incredibly taste, tasteless ads six days after the Oklahoma City bombing, advertising all of these really crude t-shirts with jokes about the Oklahoma City bombing and dead children. And they uh, put in the ad, ask for Ken, and they posted his home number. He kept, they kept posting these ads. He kept calling AOL. AOL did not really, frankly, take it seriously, and they did not do enough to block this from happening. He ended up having to go on medication because he was so distraught. A DJ in Oklahoma City read his ads on the air. Uh, he ends up suing AOL, and the lawsuit ends up hitting right after Section 230 is passed. And AOL, to its credit, ends up getting Pat Carome, who's a lawyer at Wilmer, I forgot what, now it's uh, Wilmer Hale, uh, it's Wilmer Hale's predecessor, uh, and he's this uh, great media lawyer, and he knows about Section 230, and he thinks, hey, let's let's try this out. <laughs> and he <laughs> he makes this argument, and he it's filed in the 
Federal Quirk in Alexandria, which is a, the rocket docket. So it's a very fast, uh, fast schedule. So within weeks, he briefs it. They have a hearing. It goes before Judge Ellis, who's the judge who just presided over the Manafort uh, case. And Ellis, uh, through, throughout the hearing, is just being walked through the statute. And Ellis agrees with uh, Pat Carone that Section 230 provide, presents this absolute bar to mm. lawsuits arising from third-party content, regardless of whether the provider knew about it. Now, um, what, what Ken's lawyer was trying to say is all Section 230 does is tr say that you can't be treated as the publisher if you're an online service, but you're still treated as a distributor. Mm. So if you get notice of the content, you're going to be held liable. Uh, Judge Ellis rejects that reasoning. And then basically in a further stroke of bad luck to Mr. Zarin, it goes to the Fourth Circuit, which was in the 90s was a pretty conservative uh, group of judges. But the judge who's who was on the panel, uh, or one of the three judges, uh, Chief Judge Wilkinson, is a former newspaper editor. <laughs> so he um, <laughs> he has a very strong free speech streak to, to him, and he basically builds on Ellis's opinion and writes this incredibly eloquent and, I would say, very sweeping opinion about how Section 230 is this absolute immunity for websites arising from user content unless an exception applies. And that's basically how we got where we are now was that one ruling um, from the Fourth mm -hmm. Circuit. It's never gone to the Supreme Court. So every qu courts have had their own uh, interpretations of certain provisions of Section 230. And frankly, in the past 10 years, some courts have abrogated some of the immunity. But uh, everyone has built their reasoning off of Judge Wilkinson's opinion from the Fourth Circuit. Wow. Yeah. And one of the things that really struck me about the origin story of Section 230 and this sort of protection for for internet providers uh, is is the sort of um, almost contingency of it. Like, I mean, it's almost like it was a function of this really formalistic reading of uh, sort of metaphors about a f one context that maybe didn't track all that well onto a whole new technological context, and I can't just I, I can't help but speculate or, or wonder what you think really about what would have happened if you know the lower court judge in the those previous kind of internet liability cases had kind of looked at it in a more kind of practical kind of legal realist context about what the nature of the service being provided was. Yeah. I, so, so I think that section 230 probably would not have come into being had it not been for the prodigy case, um, because that really raised this concern about, uh, a, about services being held liable for all user content. And if if there hadn't been that case, there wouldn't have been sufficient justification for Cox and Wyden to have pushed forward to uh, to basically sell their proposal to all of their colleagues because their key selling point was this will actually encourage responsible moderation. So I I, I think that if we hadn't had the, this and the the judge who decided this case in uh, on Long Island against Prodigy, um, he was not, he, he had a lot of his own controversies. Um, he had been censured a few years earlier for making racist comments to a lawyer. Um, so this, this wasn't exactly like a federal appellate court or the Supreme Court ruling against someone. It was a single state court trial judge in New York, but it, it did really have a significant impact on the legislative debate. And in fact, in the conference report for Section 230, they specifically cite that opinion. So do you think that Cox and Wyden and Congress in general really anticipated that Section 230 would be interpreted in the way that it was? Or is the ultimate interpretation in some ways different from maybe what you would characterize as their initial expectations? So I asked both Cox and Wyden that they were both kind enough to take a lot of time with me to, to interview 
be interviewed for the book. And they both said they did inter intend Section 230 to be interpreted as Judge Wilkinson did. Um, Wyden didn't even pause. He's, and he knew I, I was uh, really pleasantly surprised that a U.S. senator knew about a Fourth Circuit case from more than 20 years ago. But he, he very clearly knew about the case. And he said, yes, that's what we intended. Um, Cox also intended Judge Wilkinson's interpretation, uh, saying that preventing someone from being treated as the publisher or speaker means all liability. However, Cox, interestingly, he has a really nuanced and I think thoughtful view about Section 230. He does think that there are some courts since the Zarin case that have, uh, I think he, he phrased it as uh, imposed a significant amount of judicial embroidery on the statute. <laughs> um, and he, he um, one case that he cites uh, that I write about quite a bit in the book is a case of a woman named Ellen Batesel, who uh, she was a lawyer who uh, had been in California. She moved to North Carolina and she uh, was rebuilding her life because her, the company she had worked for had uh, kind of a rocky collapse. She was starting to practice law. She had a lot of clients and she suddenly starts losing all of these clients. Uh, she was representing art galleries and entertainment clients. And a few months after this starts happening, she gets an anonymous letter in the mail. And the letter is a post on something called Museum Security Network, which is a nonprofit that was run out of the Netherlands. And uh, it was a post from an email that a handyman who had worked at her house months earlier had written. They'd gotten into some sort of dispute um, about both the work, uh, primarily about the quality of the work that he'd provided. And he wrote in it, uh, I did work for a woman named Ellen Batesel. Uh, I noticed that there was a lot of fancy artwork on her walls. Uh, and she also mentioned that she was the descendant of a of a Nazi, I think it was Himmler. Um, and he basically strongly implied that she was Himmler's granddaughter and she had stolen Nazi artwork. Um, so when he sent this to the Museum Security Network, the guy who ran it, basically he, he just emailed it to them. The guy who ran it copied it, made a few editorial adjustments to it, sent it out to the listserv and posted it on the website. So that explained why her life started falling apart and why she started losing clients. So she sues. And what the Ninth Circuit, it, it goes all the way up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit says, um, you know, we feel badly about this, but what Section 230 says is this applies to the Museum Security Network, even though he did not, uh, even though the operator of the website and listserv made the conscious choice to post it, and even though he made some editorial changes, um, it applies, and there was a dispute about, but, but they sent it back to the district court to look at whether it was reasonable for him to believe that it was intended for publication. But uh, this really is probably the broadest reading of Section 230 that there ever has been. Mm. And Cox said that he has some real reservations about that case because he said, you know, I intended this at the time for such services like AOL and Prodigy to handle massive amounts of content, not one guy who gets an email decides to make some edits to it and send it out to people. He said that's not really what Section 230 was intended for. Mm -hmm. So in, in your book, you, you argue that Section 230 was functionally instrumental in the development of the internet as we know it today. And, and I was wondering if you, could, if you could talk a little bit about why you think that is. Yeah, so... If you look at the most popular websites in the United States, uh, at least ranked by Alexa, you look at the top 10 or 20, almost all of them rely on user content to different degrees. There uh, could be some like Facebook and Twitter that are fully user content based. Uh, I would say Amazon even relies on user content to a good degree for its reviews, Yelp, Wikipedia, uh, Google, uh, the only one that in the top 10 that doesn't really is Netflix. And you think about how these sites could function if they did not have Section 230. So without Section 230, you go back to the rule from Eliezer Smith, where it says you're liable if you knew or should have known 
of defamatory or otherwise illegal third-party content. So what, what would that mean for Facebook? Um, Facebook, clearly, if they got a complaint about a post, they would have to take it down immediately, or they would have to be placed in the shoes of the writer and defending it in court, which I don't think Facebook, Twitter, or any of the sites would want to do. Um, but then you also look at the should have known aspect. Uh, what would it mean for Facebook or Twitter should have known of the of the content? And that that that's where that's where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and that may be good or bad. Uh, I mean, so the, especially in recent years, there have been some uh, so, some clear demonstrations of Facebook and Twitter's failure to to responsibly moderate, leading to some really significant social problems. So, but but and you you then also would apply it to something like Yelp. Uh, so Yelp is probably a classic example where if um, Yelp had to once it became aware of a complaint about a user review, it would either have to take it down or defend it in court. Uh, I think that you'd see a lot of five star, a lot more five star average reviews on Yelp um, mm. because any business is going to just start making complaints about the about the content of reviews that don't give them five stars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can't help but wonder, like, would like what we think of as social media today even be possible without the kind of immunity provided by Section 230? I think it would be a lot harder. I, I, I think um, I don't know whether Facebook or Twitter could have developed in the way that they did um, with, without Section 230, because Section 230 really allowed them to come up with whatever business model they wanted and build it around user content and not fear the liability. Uh, I'm, I'm not making necessarily a, a normative judgment about whether that's entirely good or bad. I, as, as I mm -hmm. describe in my book, I, my, my conclusion on that evolved over time because I, I was much strong, more strongly in support of Section 230 before I wrote the book, and I still overall on balance think that it's a social positive, but there are a lot of really bad things that have happened mm -hmm. because of these sort of free open platforms that didn't really develop responsibly. So in um, one of my other areas that I study is privacy and cybersecurity, and mm. there's concepts in both of those fields called privacy by design and cybersecurity by design, where you build privacy and, and security into a product from the very beginning rather than try to fix it later. And the idea is that if it's always at the core of the product or service, that it's much more thoughtful and much more likely to mitigate harms. Um, I, I think that you have a similar concept with user content. How do you, that it's much easier to build a platform around user content if you build responsible moderation practices in from the beginning. And that frankly just has not happened with modern social media. Um, mm. What you what you see right now with Facebook and Twitter and all, YouTube all now suddenly hiring all of these moderators, that this is all after the fact. And they're trying to build all of this new moderation on top of these 10, 10 year old 15 year old companies and it's not working out that well so i think se section 230 allowed them to start out as these free forums and they've had huge social positives uh, and mm -hmm. I, I i think that there are some that get overlooked one i mentioned in the book is the me too movement um i don't think the me too movement could have happened without section 230 because you had a lot of people making a lot of uh, statements often naming names. And I I don't know how Twitter would have been able to host some of that content um, without Section 230. And uh, mm. similarly, if you remember last summer, there were, it seemed unfortunately like every week or two, there was someone else uh, putting on YouTube or on other social media sites, videos of someone engaging in some sort of racist behavior, like telling a child that she can't sell lemonade. Um, those are things that raise public awareness, but um, they're, they're also, I, I, I really think that sort of content relies heavily on the mm. protections that Section 230 provides. So in your book, 
you, you 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 talk about, or rather, you've already talked about in this interview some of the harms as well as the positive caused, or at least maybe just not prevented or permitted by um, by Section two thirty. And I know a lot of people have been talking recently about some of those harms and how Section two thirty may kind of exacerbate them. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about you know some of the harms that Section two thirty makes it really hard or even impossible to prevent. Yeah. So the unfortunately, there's quite a few of them, um, but. I, and I think Section 230 is only partly responsible, I would say. So um, there's, and I'll go back to Ellen Batesel. I spoke with her for a while, and she very much disagrees with Section 230. And she's a lawyer. She's thought about this a lot. She actually, ironically enough, went to some sort of sort of legal conference where one of the topics they were discussing is how do we fix the Batesel case, <laughs> even though she, it, it was, but she, um, I, I said, so do you think section 230 caused your harm? And she paused for a second and she said, well, this guy was in the Netherlands and I don't think he knew about section 230. Um, and she said, can I curse on this podcast? You, you absolutely okay. can. So she said, people are going to be assholes. And that was, <laughs> I think, one of the most insightful things anyone I talked with for the book had said, uh, people mm. are going to be assholes. And Section mm -hmm. 230 might help amplify those assholes' voices, but they're still going to be assholes. And mm. I don't necessarily <laughs> think that Section 230 has caused every bad person to be a bad person. Uh, Section 230 mm -hmm. may have provided them with more of a megaphone to amplify the awful things that they state. So I, so I, I think that I, I don't necessarily think Section 230 created uh, the negative aspects of humankind. That said, mm -hmm. Section 230 does provide mechanisms for some of that negative content to be widely distributed. Uh, I think probably one of the most difficult cases, uh, this is something I described toward the end of the book, is uh, the online sex trafficking. There was a site called Backpage, which has since been shut down. And it was like Craigslist, except uh, it really functioned, or it had a portion of it that functioned as really a marketplace for sex traffickers, often people who were trafficking teenage runaways. And it was very well known and Backpage had publicly stated it was taking certain steps to help work with law enforcement, but there was a Senate investigation that suggested that Backpage actually made it more difficult for law enforcement to do its job and made it easier for these ads to continue running um, without being I, I, without identifying the perpetrators. So um, that there were a few victims who were 15 at the time when they were trafficked. That a few years later, they file a lawsuit against Backpage under a federal trafficking statute, and it goes up to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and they dismiss the lawsuit because of Section 230. And they say, you know, we this is a terrible case. But Section 230 says what it says. This is third-party content. So Congress actually did amend Section 230 to address the sex trafficking issue because, I mean, frankly, this I, I think the First Circuit was incorrect in its ruling because I think that Backpage mm -hmm. did enough to contribute to the development of the content. But mm -hmm. it also was not something that uh, Congress was willing to wait for the courts to sort out. So that was probably the most difficult. Uh, also, the fact that from really 2014 to 2016, ISIS really weaponized Twitter in terms of propaganda, fundraising, recruitment. And Twitter has started to take some responsible steps, but has at the time they really marketed themselves as this megaphone for free speech, which frankly Section 230 allowed. And I, I think that was a significant harm. Similarly, YouTube hosted a lot of Al-Qaeda recruitment videos, and it took them for a while, years, before they started really making efforts to take them down. So th mm -hmm. those are some of the things that I think Section 230 has 
enabled some irresponsibility. And I think part of the problem here is that the platforms really forgot about why Cox and Wyden were able to justify passing Section 230. Part of it was this innovation and free speech that they wanted to promote in 95 and 96. But the other part was they, they really strongly believed that the platforms via their users are better suited to determine moderation policies and procedures. And um, I think a lot of platforms have started to recognize this and have made strides to come up with thoughtful moderation, but the big players took far too long. And where they, they also have not been until recently very transparent about how they moderate content. So I, I think we're st we're starting to see some improvements, but I also don't necessarily think that the improvements have happened fast enough to satisfy the many critics. Recently, I've seen an increasing number of people argue that Section 230 uh, facilitates or even enables some pretty horrific like revenge porn and whatnot as well. And, and it seems like people have been proposing like various kinds of statutory and maybe or maybe kind of judicial interpretation changes to Section 230. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think about those kinds of proposals and whether it's a problem that can or should be addressed. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of problems with uh, th that are out there with user content. I think revenge pornography is one of them. Um, I... I'm not sure about more legislative fixes to narrow out individual, to carve out individual ills because there are so many of them. So um, there's a lawyer in New York named Carrie Goldberg, and she uh, she really does the Lord's work. She represents people who are the victims of harassment and revenge pornography. Uh, that That's her entire practice. She's built a really successful law firm out of that. and the cases that she deals with, I just follow her cases, and it's actually morphed from just revenge pornography to uh, things like there was actually a case that uh, her firm took all the way up to the Second Circuit that involved someone whose ex uh, posted material on a dating app that basically caused hundreds and hundreds of people to visit his workplace and home demanding sex. And that really was a threat to his safety. And that those, so, so that's even more than just revenge pornography. So what I worry about with uh, having too many carve outs is I don't necessarily think that they will, that these carve outs will address the harms that are going to happen a few years from now. They might address the harms right now. Um, it's kind of like when Congress passed the Video Privacy Protection Act right after Bork's video rental records were disclosed in the late 1980s. Uh, they passed a law protecting the records from videotape service providers. Um, that's still on the books, but we obviously have much more sensitive privacy-related data. So um, what, what I would rather see happen is, and I make this argument whenever I am talking with any tech company and they may or may not listen is they need to take really seriously their responsibilities under what I see as a contract for section 230 to responsibly moderate content. And they're not going to do a perfect job, no matter what, no matter what laws on the books and no matter what moderation procedures companies develop, they're never going to be able to catch 100% of the harmful content. And they're also never going to be able to allow 100% of the legitimate content through, in part because you don't know what legitimate content actually is. But I do think I, I do think they can do more to meet their obligations. What, what I really see is an obligation under Section 230. It's not perhaps a literal requirement, but I think the reason for existence of Section 230 is the idea that these platforms can responsibly moderate content. So, so Jeff, in closing, I was wondering if you could reflect on, you know, if somebody put you in charge and said you can make 
any change to the language of text section 230, any addition or subtraction, or any change to the way that courts interpret the meaning of section 230. Are there any changes that you would make that you think might result in improvements or would you just leave it like it is? Yeah. So I've thought a lot about that. And the one issue where I would like to see, where, where I, I think would add to some equities would be if there would be more willingness to allow a limited amount of pre uh, pre-dismissal discovery as to a website or platform's role in potentially creating content because Section 230 doesn't apply if a website actually helped to create the content. And the problem that we have in a lot of these cases, including the Backpage case, was that these websites would be taking some, have some role in the content, but it's not clear to a plaintiff who's suing. Um, so what I would like to see is an ability in certain cases, so not in every case, but it, if there's a certain threshold met, and I think that would have to be hammered out as to what that would be, to allow some limited discovery as to what role the platform played in creating content because that would allow some, I think that would prevent some of the uh, dismissals under Section 230 that frankly aren't warranted. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Jeff, and congratulations on your fantastic book. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Ronald McDonald was sitting at a table with papers all around him. He was reading some of the papers and writing on some of them when his friend the professor came up to him holding something covered by a red cloth. Good morning, Ronald. Oh, hello, professor. I didn't see you come up. I'm busy getting ready for the new McDonaldland show. It's going to be great. We're going to have daredevil acts, jokes, juggling, all kinds of things. Uh, what about music? Well, so far, everybody wants to be on the stage, not the band. Good. That's where I can help, Ronald. Great. What instrument do you play, Professor? I don't play any instrument, Ronald. I just wanted you to use my newest invention. Is that it there? Yes. This is my music machine. A machine that makes music? Not any old music. Every kind of music. That's terrific, Professor. So no matter what kind of music we need... That machine can give it to us? Right, Ronald. It's got a computer inside. So if you want to hear happy music, you push this button here. If you want exciting music, this is the button. Whatever kind of music you want, there's a button. That's terrific, Professor. Could we use it in our show? Oh, I was hoping you would, Ronald. But I'd have to work it, of course. Oh, naturally. Oh, this is going to be a great show. The day for the new McDonaldland show soon came. Everybody was ready. Ronald and all his friends had been practicing for weeks. The professor had set up his music machine behind the curtain and was making last-minute adjustments. Then the spotlight came on, and Mayor McCheese walked on stage. Opening music, professor. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the McDonald Land Show. We got lots of exciting stuff for you, don't you know? So to get the show started, here's Ronald McDonald and his amazing juggling act. Juggling music, Professor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You've seen people juggling five or six balls, but here's 12, 25, 37, 37 balls and five chairs. While Ronald was on stage with his juggling act, his big purple friend Grimace wandered over by the Professor, who was busy with his music machine. Uh, hi, Professor. What you got there? Uh, hello, Grimace. Uh, this is my music machine. Uh, wow! I bet it plays music, huh? Oh, that's right, Grimace. Uh, oh, my goodness. I just remembered something. I forgot to turn off the water in my bathtub at home. Oh, lamb sakes. Whatever should I do? Uh, turn it off? Right, Grimace. 
Good idea. I must rush home and turn off the water before my house floats away. At the here, you work my music machine. But how? It's easy. Just push the buttons. Uh, okay. With that, the professor ran off home. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bertie the early bird will ride a bicycle on the high wire. Dramatic music, please. Uh, I wish Ronald could see me. <laughs> I guess I'll push this button. There goes Bertie on the high wire. Backwards. Wait a, wait a minute, that's not the right music. Bertie's done and gracefully lands in the safety net. <laughs> Next, the masters of funny business. It's the captain and his parrot. Uh, thank you, thank you. Ah, I bet everybody thinks I'm sitting on your shoulder. So? Ah, they don't realize I'm really holding you up. Button your beak, you balmy ah, bird. Funny music. Knock, knock. Who's there? Arch. Arch who? Gesundheit. <laughs> this isn't funny music. Something funny is going on here. Boy, <laughs> this music machine is fun. <laughs> Look at all these buttons. Uh, what goes 99 clump? 99 clump. Ah, a centipede with a wooden leg. We present now Hamburglar, reading a poem entitled Charge of the Light Brigade. Bravo, bravo, poetry bravo, music. Bravo, 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 bravo. That's not rubble, poetry rubble, music. Rubble, 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 What's the professor rubble, trying to do? Rubble, 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 Ronald rubble, rubble, finally looked in back of the curtain, rubble, and rubble, there was Grimace rubble, working rubble, the music rubble, machine. Rubble, Grimace! Oh, uh, Ronald, help! The professor's not here, and his machine is out of control. It's rumbling and shaking like it's going to explode. Get away, Grimace! I've got an idea. Get everybody in the middle of the stage. Signal, you'll light these fireworks. Aye, aye, Ronald. Ladies and gentlemen, the grand finale to our show! Okay, Captain. Well, gang, looks like our show was a success after all. Ronald, I I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, how was the music? It was a real blast, Professor. <laughs> <laughs>